live, Tyler, if you're ready, in five, four, three, two, one. Have a great show. Good morning and welcome to NFTs Live. I'm your host, Tyler D. It is Friday, December 3rd, a nice and fairly warm day in Chicago. As you can see, it is holiday season in full swing at my house. It's board ape season in the NFT world who is having a hell of a week. And then today the punks market woke up and chose absolute violence. We'll cover all that on today's show. We've got a great lineup for today. We're going to hit, starting with top news, we're gonna talk about Adidas and the BAYC collab and uh, the movement in the market from that this week. We're gonna talk about Coinbase's latest project announcements, then hit Murat Pak's record-breaking project drop on Nifty Gateway this week. Then we'll hit our market update, taking a look at the lucky trader board from and the winners of the seven day week. We'll hit one of ones and X copies latest auction. We'll hit blue chip PFPs and art blocks and highlight Matt Kane's new curated drop coming up next Monday. And then the second half of the show, we've got an interview with the Society of the Hourglass team talking about their approach to Web3 entertainment, creator platforms, jump cut media, and much, much more. Sound good? Let's get started. All right, top news story for today. Adidas doubles down on their collab with Ford Apes and Punks Comics. So they made a big splash on December 2nd. They released this Twitter post. It has this video that I'm showing here from their Twitter page. It's time to enter our world of limitless possibilities, adidas.com backslash metaverse. So Adidas is making their metaverse play. They have this animated video with G Money, the Punk's comic character, as well as the Bored Ape. And they went further to change their PFP to a Bored Ape NFT. Huge news from Adidas. It shows how serious they are about Bored Apes and the metaverse in general. Top two comments if you scroll down. Coinbase NFT, let's go. We'll see you there. Metaverse, previously Facebook. We can't wait to see Adidas in the metaverse. So some of the biggest companies interacting with this post, clearly having an impact in the market as well. We'll take a look at uh, the details on the board here in a bit in the show. But overall, <clears throat> the Apes floor went over 50 ETH on this news this <coughs> week. And we've seen nothing but when are they going to flip punks at floor price chatter on NFT Twitter this week. Uh, along with that, Punk's comic near all-time high at 7.9 ETH floor, and Meta Heroes up almost 100% around 4.4. So big, big impacts, and it really seems like Adidas may have set a new floor for Bored Apes and Punk's comics with this news. That's our lead-in. Let's hit our second news story in Coinbase NFT. So for those who have been following, we know the Coinbase NFT marketplace is coming. We don't know exactly when. It is coming. They've been doing a bit of a slow roll and every week or every other week or so announcing some new projects. This Wednesday, we got a new list, just three more projects and artists to be added. First, Bowocious, you know, one of the most precocious young artists in the crypto art and NFT space. He will be included on Coinbase. We've got Derek's, Derek Adams and him as a legendary artist and then the the pfp added here for this week the gutter cat gang um so from a pfp perspective gutter cats did go up about 10 percent. so there is a little bit of a coinbase pump still active in the market but you know at this point do we really think it's just going to be a limited set of projects or are all the major blue chips going to end up on the marketplace here in their initial launch I feel like they're all going to be there. Um, so is the Coinbase pump really, should it be existing or should it be just built into the market price? I feel like it should be built in, but we continue to see a slight pump on the announcement. Certainly Mechaverse and On1 benefited strongly from the last Coinbase announcement and Guttercat here a bit as well. So have to pay attention. The biggest question is, when is this coming? Is it gonna happen in 2022? The clock is ticking Coinbase. All right, let's get to our third and arguably top story of the week here. 
Murat Pak dropped his latest open edition project last night on Nifty Gateway. It's called Merge. It had a 30 minute early access window and then the public access started at 6.30 Eastern. Yesterday evening running for 48 hours. Uh, let's run through the project from the page a little bit here. So Pac, one of the very first artists to, to do these level of open editions. This one's got a some very interesting uh, mechanics behind it. Um, so the token mechanism from the project page has a built-in scarcity mechanism to ensure token supply decreases over time. Every, mer every merge token transfer merges it with the token in the recipient wallet adding up the mass value. Um, so essentially on the way this is going to work for every primary sale, let's say you bought 10 merge NFTs yesterday at completion of the sale, those are going to merge into one NFT. And then if you buy additional on secondary, every time you buy, it will merge those NFTs together upon each transaction. So you'll essentially just have one token and that is how it will continue to deflate the overall supply. Um, they're generated dynamically based on the total mass of the NFT, essentially how many that you have. It has a token yield structure that's going to be released three weeks after the sale, the ASH token. Uh, so it's got that bit of tokenomics built in. Um, and then there's also an added bonus. So for every 10 to the N mass you acquire, you get N out of 10 extra. So essentially, if you buy 10, you get one extra and they've got some charts that, that go through all this and how many bonus tokens you can expect. There's leaderboards, there's prizes for the top buyers and sellers. The price does increase. So it started at $299 in the presale, $400 on the public scale, and goes up $25. But I bury the lead. <clears throat> the lead is this number right here. We've seen over 247,000 of these edition NFT tokens from Pac bought on Nifty Gateway here in less than 24 hours. It's been about, uh, what, 20 hours or so now since this opened. He's pocketed over 80 million in revenue based on the tiering pricing structure. So they sold about 175,000 in that first 30 minutes in the presale. Uh, that was at the lowest price point and have since already sold about 75,000 and this is live and going for over 24 more hours. So I'd say the over-under is over 100 million at this point that Pot can expect to bring in. I think this is going to cement him as the number one artist of the year by revenue, or else it's going to be very close with Beeple. So Beeple set the single sale record at 65 million uh, for 5,000 days. This is going to surpass that. I've got Beeple somewhere around 150 million in revenue for the year. I think uh, Pac is going to have a, a big chance to break that here. So certainly check this one out. Uh, you know, Nifty Gateway, we don't cover it a lot on this show, but as I, I went in and I did buy a few of these uh, yesterday myself, and then I went in and checked in on my Nifty Gateway NFT collection, they're up. So there certainly is some real demand in the Nifty Gateway market right now. Uh, I encourage folks to, to take a look on that site if you haven't already. All right, well, that takes us through our three top news stories. Let's go ahead and jump into our market update. Let's take a look at the seven-day board from our friends over at Lucky Trader. So we, we talked about uh, the board apes here a bit in the beginning, but they are the winner of the week from a volume standpoint. Uh, 7,200 7, ETH volume in the past 70 days, past seven days, rather. Floor of 49 ETH, um, just rock solid. In fact, that floor had dropped this morning. It was around 50.7 uh, just a few hours ago. But board apes continue to do really well. Mutant apes tagging along <clears throat> a little bit less volume, almost 3,000 ETH here. Their floor up a bit on the, the Adidas news, sitting around a 6.4. The second leader on the board, Artifact and Clone X. So we highlighted that drop on Monday's show, uh, it was a, it was originally a Dutch auction. Their site they they got attacked and exploited a little bit. They stopped the uh, the Dutch auction. They restarted it Tuesday afternoon with just a flat two ETH sell price. It sold out fairly quickly. I want to say within twenty to thirty minutes or so. Um, there was a little bit of fud 
from the early buyers, but the artifact team is doing an airdrop uh, raffle for those who bought early. But no one can argue with the uh, the market demand here pre-reveal. We've seen the floor surge up to 2.7. Um, certainly, this is a product I'm watching closely, pretty bullish on everything they're doing, especially with those on cyber pods that are going to be airdropped to the clone X holders. So check that out on their website if you haven't already. I'll be curious to see what happens post reveal. Typically, the floors drop a bit. I'm personally waiting for that to see if I will have a nice entry point. Um, but certainly a strong new PFP project with a, a big name artist to watch here. Punk's on the board here at 55.99 ETH on the week. I think the biggest story is the floor drop now, 71 ETH, down 15% <clears throat> on the week. Um, so it's been increasing chatter about apes flipping punks and if and when that's going to happen. Well, it's going to happen a lot sooner if the punk floor keeps dropping this fast. I think most of us were thinking, you know, when is board ape going to get to 70 or 80 ETH floor? Now it seems like the narrative might be when is Punk's going to come down below 60 and what will that floor eventually look like? We'll cover this more when we get into blue chip PFPs and talk about some of the recent sales. Um, we've got Wolf Game next on the board here at 4,600 ETH sold. You know, their floor has been actually been down a bit or fairly steady here since they paused and unpaused the game and migrated to their new contract. One product that's not on this list, Lucky Trader isn't tracking just yet, is the Wizards and Dragons game. So they did 6,000 ETH in volume here. It is essentially a wolf game clone. Um, the characters in that game are wizards and dragons. It's all about guarding the tower. They've got their own token is involved in the, their version of the ecosystem with staking and its own tokenomics. One thing they did differently is they did hire a bug bounty. I think it was $50,000 for any dev or anyone who's able to find holes or exploits in their con in their smart contracts and help them fix that. So I think they paid out over $200,000. So certainly some good action there. Um, but at the basis, it is essentially still a copy of the Wolf game. Um, I'm curious to see how long these these games will last. But you know, we're seeing over 10,000 ETH demand just in the past seven days. So certainly something to pay attention to. All right, just a few more products I want to cover on the board here this week. If we scroll down a little bit, Worldwide Webland has done 2,500 ETH, sits at a 0.44. I'm going to go ahead and show their OpenSea page here. Um, so essentially what uh, this project is, it's, uh, I'd say it's a combination of metaverse, uh, virtual lands combined with gaming. I think the closest analogy project for me is Treeverse. Um, so when you buy these NFTs, there's four different types small apartments, medium apartments, large apartments, and penthouses. You can essentially interact in those places. What's different from Treeverse and others is that you can use some of your own NFTs as your avatars. So you can be in your World Wide Web land as a punk, as an ape, as a crypto just recently. So I think that's something that people are certainly looking fondly on. We've seen some nice price action. The floor sits over 0.4 right now for the cheapest entry, which is the small apartment. If we go down, the large apartments sit at a 1.9 ETH floor. And the penthouses, get ready, 37 ETH floor to buy one of the 59 penthouses. Um, this is you know, a product definitely gaining, gaining steam. I bought a few of these and very interested in this project and see where, uh, where this is going to go. The last one I'm going to highlight from the week, we scroll down, it's MFers from Sartoshi, 1,770 ETH on the week. The floor sits at a 0.21, fairly approachable. We'll also take a look at their OpenSea page here just briefly. Uh, so for those who may or may not know Sartoshi, he is the NFT meme lord of NFT Twitter. Multiple hilarious tweets and memes per day. He dropped his own collection kind of based on that the running meme are you winning son with the the son sitting at the computer here with his headphones on uh you know interacting with crypto web 3. Um, so this gained some real steam on the drop it minted out in a gas war in about 10 minutes uh on tuesday when it dropped um the effective price was about 0.25 and then we saw some market action up to about 0.3 since retraced a bit but is fairly steady so 
congrats to Sartoshi on a really cool drop here this week. All right, that takes us through our market update. Let's go ahead and get into one of Wonderland and highlight a few leading stories here for this week. So the top story in super rare and one of one world is X copy. He dropped a new piece. The auction ends just one day and six hours from now. You see the piece here, it's called Decay, subtitled Programmed In. And the current high bid right now is Starry Night at that mean price of 269. Um, Starry Night actually set the X copy primary sale record on his last drop, uh, purchasing at 469 ETH on Dankrupt. So I've been sharing with a few friends on what we think the over under for this piece is. I think we're going to see it finish out below that 469 line. I actually set my initial line at around 300 ETH. That's looking probably a bit low given where we're at still with a day left in this bidding war. Um, I'd probably set my line at about 369 right now. So I think for sure it'll end in a mean price, um, but I do not think we will set a new primary high on this one. I think one driver for that is we're seeing a decent amount of supply continuing to come in the market. A lot of artists still plan to drop pieces here in December. And I just don't think we've seen that much of the buyer pool grow uh, in the one of one, especially on the top tier uh, sector. So we've, we've seen a few new whales enter the space, um, but I think most of the top collectors exhausted a good amount of their funds during one of one season back in October. Uh, and I don't know that there's a, a whole lot of ETH still, still left to go after these, but of course, X copy is one to watch. So we'll certainly be watching as this auction closes tomorrow afternoon. Second one of one story here for today, uh, Drifter Shoots sets his all-time high sale on Super Rare for a home for my ancestors. Uh, it's a, a pick, you know, as always, high in the sky. This one of the Simon Kenton Bridge. Um, so those who may or may not be familiar with Drifter Shoots, uh, gain, a, gain a steam with his Where My Vans Go series, which sells more on OpenSea. Again, his MO is beautiful landscapes taken from very high places. He gets to places where no one else can go and takes photos. And of course they um, are, are essentially unmatched in the photo NFT space at this point in time. Um, his OpenSea NFTs have gone for higher prices than this one, which sold for 25, but this is again, his record now on super rare. And I think it just, it goes to speak about where the photo NFT market is right now. So certainly I think photography NFTs are taking off uh, with Justin Abrasano launching the quantum marketplace that definitely propelled this sector into the headlines a bit. And then we've also seen some recent whale action. Whale Shark uh, publicly went and bought 40 to 50 photo NFTs here this past week. So certainly um, a very hot sector of the market right now. Last story and kind of a general trend that we're seeing is top crypto artists getting into the PFP or larger uh, collection size projects. So what we're showing right now is Hackatow's upcoming project called Queens and Kings. So I'll go through the project in their website just a bit here. We are all Queens and Kings, sovereigns of our, of our creative realm. We crown ourselves. Um, so as we, as we scroll through this, Hecatow will be launching an innovative NFT art project in December, the first of its kind, encouraging crypto collectors to express themselves creatively through actively engaging in an artistic journey. Um, it's been developed with NFT studios and supported by Sotheby's. Let's see here, as we continue to scroll down, what makes Queens and Kings different from other avatar projects? It's Hecatow giving the possibility to compose and customize their own avatars. So what does that mean? Traits will be randomly allocated to algorithmically generated avatars. After the first generative mint, the avatar can then be hacked, disassembled, and assembled again because of all these unisect traits with different rarity, essentially all interchangeable. So what that means is you're gonna mint an NFT. Afterwards, you're going to have the chance to take those traits down, 
disassemble them and put them together in combination. So kind of similar with what we've seen from projects like Omnimorphs with their fusion uh, tactic. So very curious to see what this means. It definitely creates a game of infinite possibilities as they say here on their site. Uh, some launch mechanics, they are going to do a 23 hour Genesis release open to Hackertile collectors as well as Sotheby's collectors and then it will go into the public sale. We're going to do a few, that again is in December. In 2022, he plans to do two more, two more drops of 2,300 avatars each for a total supply of 6,900. Hackatow and the community will be hacking the Royals, introducing an alternate division on collectibles. Um, so this is certainly a, a huge one to watch. Hackatow, one of, I'd say the top three, top five, crypto artists out there right now. His floors on super rare command about 150 ETH, half a million dollars or so. Um, certainly one of the OGs. And I think this again speaks to a new trend that we're seeing it, with top artists doing these types of projects. So we saw Searlight and his capsule house project, uh, a 10 K essentially PFP type project. Um, now Matt Kane, Another, uh, I'd say top five, top 10 crypto artist on Super Rare. He's doing his piece on Art Blocks, which we'll cover here uh, just a bit on the show. So certainly crypto artists getting more active in the, the NFT and blue chip PFP space. With that, let's go ahead and get to our next segment, blue chip PFPs. Let's talk about punks. So I'm going to show the punk sales board. It was absolutely a violent, violent morning in the crypto punk space. Just take a look at the top of the sales board here. Just in the past one hour, 12 different sales. It was led by a few of the more famous uh, punk holders dumping a few punks essentially. Several of these dumped, I'd say well below their trade floors, 10 to 20% or so. Just some amazing deals to have been had by those who were actively following and playing in the market this morning. We've already seen our first flip. Uh, the, the blonde clown here bought for 70 ETH just an hour ago and sold for 81.99 here just a bit ago. Um, we see two VR punks here sold under under 100. That four has been 110 to 120. Some great albinos. We got the 3D cop as well. So this all has led to some increasing cope and chatter of again, when apes flip punks certainly if some of the the larger punk bag holders are fine capitulating and selling at 70 or below uh, that flipping may happen sooner than later so that's what's going on with the punk board let's go ahead and go over to wgmi and check the overall blue chip floors so <clears throat> with punks dropping number one on the board now is kong's genesis Kong's Genesis coming in at 73.694 here this morning, down 17% still on the week. Punks, again, the leading story from Blue Chip PFP is coming in at just a 70.95 floor, down 16% on the week. From those who've been tracking this market, it was as high as 140 or so at all-time high. So down just about 50% from all-time high. The green on the board, board apes, we've covered them in enough detail, but we see 50.5 for their floor, a bit different from what Lucky Trader's showing, but directionally we know where it's at. They're definitely up on the week. As we continue to scroll down, I'd say the rest of the board, fairly quiet, fairly steady on the week here. So Cool Cats, 7.4, essentially even on the week. Mutant Apes, 6.3, up 10%. Cyber Kongs, 4.8, <clears throat> floor down about 8%. Let's see, we talked about gutter cats, they're up about 10%. Cryptodes, they're at 3.4. It feels like that's kind of the floor they keep coming back to. Nebits at 3.4 also. Somewhat steady on the week here. Again, overall, been somewhat quiet. We'll go ahead and go into Art Blocks, cover some of their primary floors and notable sales here. If we scroll back up to the top of the board. Medenza's at a 90 ETH floor down 18% on the week. Um, those have been coming down and going back up really over the past few weeks. There was a sale with the Pedenza around 95. I think we saw a high sale around 240 in the past week as well. 
as we scroll down, it's continued red. So we've got ringers now sub 50 coming in at a 48 ETH floor there for that collection. Elevated deconstructions here at 42. Then as we scroll down, archetypes now 14 down just a bit on the week. Subscapes at 8 ETH down 13% on the week. Squiggles at 6.7. They're holding somewhat steady. The rest of the board here, mostly below a 5 ETH floor. Um, we did see that new drop bent from this week. It came out of the gate, minted out at around 0.9, I want to say, on Monday. Saw some decent price action. Got into above the 2 ETH floor before retracing a bit. Um, but we'll be very curious what happens with Monday's drop. So Monday, we've got Matt Kane, again, one of the top crypto artists in the NFT space, doing his first Art Blocks curated drop. It's called Gazers here. We're showing the project page here from Art Blocks. It's going to open up uh, next Monday, the 6th at 12 p.m. Central. Dutch auction. Uh, I'm very curious where this Dutch, this Dutch is going to end up. Um, as I mentioned, <clears throat> the bent drop closed out sub one, minted out at 0.9, which is the lowest I think we've seen in quite some time. Um, that reflects general market sentiment with art blocks right now, but Matt Kane being a, such a renowned artist, I feel like we'll see this go higher. I'd probably set the overrunner somewhere between 2.5 and three right now for this piece. Um, definitely encourage folks to read about the project. He has a lot here in his description uh, on the project page. He also did a nice interview with Jeff Davis that I encourage folks uh, to check out. But this project is very much tied to <clears throat> the moon's phases, lunar calendars. Um, he essentially has built in some evolution mechanics to these pieces so that they will continue to evolve and change over time in line with you know, a, a similar mechanic as the lunar calendar. Uh, I admittedly have not had a chance to fully digest everything here and Matt Kane's full vision uh, for this project. Um, certainly will be one to do some weekend homework on here this weekend as we prepare for Monday. Um, but, you know, given some of the success that we've seen other evolving projects have, like Mutant Garden Cedar is one that, that comes to top of mind. Uh, I think we can expect this one to have some real demand um, and certainly one to watch here next week. All right. <clears throat> That takes us through our market segments and the first half of the show. We will now switch gears and get ready for our interview segment. I'm certainly <clears throat> excited for this one. Um, so we've got two folks joining us here today. Um, I've got Joe, who is a co-founder and community lead from the Society of the Hourglass Project team, and Dilip, who leads product at Jump Cut Media. Society of the Hourglass is planning to build a Web3 entertainment brand to onboard the next generation into NFTs with the power of education through entertainment. They've recently partnered with Jump Cut Media, who uses data science to find emerging talent from platforms like YouTube, Reddit, and more to pair with the right buyers and producers in the entertainment space. Really excited for this one. Guys, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Awesome. Well, excited you both are able to join. Let's get right into it. So I think starting at the highest level, when I, when I read that tagline from your website, we'll go ahead and, and pull that up here briefly. Um, building a Web3 entertainment brand uh, you know, to onboard folks into the next generation of NFTs. That is a lofty goal. So do you have experience in this space? And kind of tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, I mean, we're nothing if not ambitious, right? I, I think it, everybody kind of has the best of intentions getting started. And so that, that was something that we were kind of really mindful of coming into this. Um, it, you know, we, we want to build something that lasts for the long term. Um, I think anyone who's building the space right now has to be in it for the long term because the market is not kind to, to new projects right now. Um, so there are a couple of things going, going back to your question. So our whole team is, just, we're a team of entrepreneurs. Most of us have worked together in real life for many years. Um, we know 
kind of each other's quirks and ins and outs. We know how to push and challenge each other. We know how to motivate and inspire each other. Um, and, and we fill in each other's gaps really, really well. Uh, and I think that just the relationship and the experience we have together there goes a long way. Um, at the same time, we, we've also been kind of on the, the ugly side of business and know what it takes to grow and build and scale and operate a company day to day, um, including like knowing what you're not good at and where your, your strengths are and aren't. And so when we, when we set out to start doing this, one of the things we knew that we needed to do was kind of fill in the gaps on the entertainment side. And that's where the, the partnership with Jump Cut Media comes into play. And I'll let Dilip um, kind of explain what, what they do and, and their background. But um, for us, like we're looking at this not as like a, a partnership between two companies. Like we're looking at Jump Cut as an extension of our team and we're all working together to build something that we're really, really excited about. And um, we think has just a ton of potential. If you look at the size of the market, right now versus what I think we all think it's going to be going into next year and beyond is like Coinbase launches their platform and we start seeing more and more um, kind of normal people getting into NFTs. I think the opportunity for education and onboarding is just massive. And so thinking about a fun, engaging way to do that is something that we're really, really excited about. Bill, I'll let you kind of intro Jump Cut and, and what you guys are bringing to the table. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. So Jump Cut Media is all about democratizing Hollywood. Uh, and the way we've been doing that is making TV and film development a lot more community centric and bottom up. Um, so what I mean by that is we've been pairing a lot of emerging writers and filmmakers with input and embedding them in digital communities, both web two and increasingly web three to harness that community's collective creativity and use that to develop a slate of TV and film projects versus the normal way, which is very top down and kind of studio exec. Uh, driven. So we've been working with a lot of folks in Hollywood, like our team has produced content for Netflix, Disney, et cetera. But what makes us really different than everyone in Hollywood is that we, we have this community driven approach. So when we encountered the society team, um, you know, first of all, just amazing team and really enjoy getting to know them and um, think they're extremely talented, but specifically, I think the vision and the art behind their project is super high potential. Like we see the beginnings of a generation defining creative universe. And we're really excited to partner up and um, figure out how to, instead of do the normal approach of optioning IP and going off and developing a project in a silo, how can we actually put the community at the center and have them have an authentic voice and be the driving force behind putting together um, the amazing animated series and other derivative entertainment projects that we can build with the community based on this creative universe that we're building together. It certainly seems like that you both have a real vision for what this is and what it can be, certainly. So are there other entertainment brands or products in the NFT space that, that you've been looking at as good examples or that you feel like have been doing this well already to potentially model after? Or do you feel like you're doing something you know, totally unique? I'm just kind of curious for your take on what we've seen really in the past you know, six to nine months for, for products trying to get into the entertainment space. Yeah, I, I, I can provide my perspective on that, but I'm, I'm actually really curious to hear Dillip's take on this too. Um, I, I mean, I think for me, I've probably got more examples of what not to do that, that I've observed in, in the space. I think there are a lot of teams and projects that have this idea and this goal of you know creating a film or an animated series based off their collection. And, and they have really good intentions. And I, I don't doubt for a second that the desire is there, but um, like it's a really hard industry to break into and, and to cut through the noise. It's no different than NFTs in that regard, I would imagine. Um, and, and so I, I'm looking more at kind of how projects are engaging their communities and how real is this idea of community-driven storytelling? Because I think we even, we see that term even thrown around a lot more and more here lately. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think one project that has been really fun and interesting to watch is um, Jenkins the Valet is doing his book with, with the, the apes and, and he's got his um, valet club. I think that they're doing things really, really smart. And I think it's, it's really cool to kind of watch 
the power of people like recognizing the influence and impact they can have on that story kind of being realized. And I, I think we have common goals in that regard. And obviously they're kind of going a different direction with, with the, the book, but um, I think in the spirit of what we're trying to create as, you know, builders and creators in the space alongside our community, there's a lot of overlap there. Um, I, you know, for every story like that, though, there's 20 others that drop, you know, we're going to launch a series on, on some vague, ambiguous roadmap that's, you know, two years post launch. I think that was another thing for us that was really important is like, we, th we don't think about our roadmap so much as a roadmap in the traditional sense as it is just trying to cast a vision for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. but like we're getting started on this now, like we haven't dropped yet, but we've signed the agreement. We've onboarded Jump Cut onto our team and we're like, we're working on this now. Um, so I think that for me is outside of just what it signals it is really important as a, as a team and like us kind of proving even to ourselves that like we're serious about this like this isn't going to be just some kind of you know vague ambiguous goal that we have and, and I don't know that I've seen any others doing that in the same way I know Roboto's just announced their deal with uh, Time Entertainment or their their, um, their brand and I think that's really awesome I love the Roboto's project and super excited for that team and I'm curious to see where they go with it but I think you know that one was a kind of post drop thing as well so yeah that, that was a big one but again those are the, a few of the success stories in the, a, a wider ocean of totally. more promises that have at least yet to be delivered yep and maybe most famously the stoner cats and, and their tv show i don't know if they even ran through all the episodes they promised or not but that's certainly yeah i think i i held a stoner cat early on because i was really intrigued by the concept but um no, I don't know. It just it didn't do it for me. And maybe I'm not the right audience for it. I think they had the first episode that was kind of quirky and fun. And, and I lost interest a little bit. Um, I, I think partially just as a collector, I, I didn't feel like connected to the process, right? It was, it was more, I'm going to sit here and wait for you to kind of feed content to me versus like what we're talking about with Jump Cut is like, let's go create the content together. Like you tell us what you want to see in this thing and, and let's go make that happen. Yeah. I mean, just go ahead. T t jumping in more on that point. I think like this, a lot of people, I guess out there and on Twitter are talking about, you know, the, the next big Marvel is going to be bottom up decentralized and that kind of thing. And, and we completely agree, but I think there's a lot to figure out in terms of how you make that happen. I think there's a lot of challenges with both. I mean, we've seen how the top-down model in Hollywood doesn't work over time. Like the success rate of films is really low and the industry isn't inclusive and you see so many sequels, but at the same time, I don't think like the totally decentralized version, which is like, like the Twitch plays Pokemon version of just like mob rule creating at the, that works either. I think like you have to design the right system where fans can come in and have influence and input. And then you also make room for, um, you know, kind of, uh, pushing that along with like writers and filmmakers and people who are like professionals and experts in their field and really talented. And I think finding the right balance where fans get to be immersed in it and have the right input, but then still being able to execute on like a high level, uh, like, you know, like industry defining quality level of like animated series or live action film is really tough too. So what we're really excited about is kind of taking our experience with both Hollywood and with working with communities online and figuring out and experimenting and finding the right balance with the society community, which is already a really robust community of creative people. Like you're all, we're already seeing people in the discord pre-drop writing fan fiction about, about characters. Uh, and I think wow. like, that's the kind of, you know, community, I think that's going to be really core to making this brand really successful. I, I've seen the growth and it's been cool to watch certainly just over the, the past few months. I, I'd love to maybe dive into just one level deeper on, on some of the tactics you're planning on, you know, how to make community engagement work just because, you know, we know the anecdote from early DAOs, right? You've got the people who, I want to join the DAO and what can I do? How, how can I contribute? Okay, we'll, we'll come to the next DAO meeting. It's, it's on Sunday at noon. Crickets, no one shows up. A month later, back in the Discord, I want to be in the DAO. How can I contribute? <laughs> like, come to the meeting. So it's, it's some of that mob, you know, decentralized mob, uh, you know, function that we've seen in, you know, disorganization and, and, and trying to crowd that all together. I'm kind of curious just for your thoughts and, and tactics on, on how to be, you know, successful with that. 
Yeah. So I know, I know Dilip has a lot of opinions on this and he and I spent some time just a couple of days ago, kind of going deep on, on the process and what is getting started look like. And um, it, I guess a couple of, of principles that I, I think we're operating under one is that we know this is going to have to be an iterative process, right? Like anytime you get this many people involved, things are kind of naturally going to become chaotic and we're going to have to figure things out. And I think that's one of the benefits of being a team of entrepreneurs is that we like, we are born and raised for that dynamic. And so I, I'm not as worried about that. Um, I think the dynamic you're talking about of, you know, balancing maybe the expression of interest versus the willingness to actually engage is a, is a real thing. And I see, I think you see that in a lot of different types of markets and dynamics. I saw, I think it was on Twitter, um, someone was talking about that specific kind of paradox and like, how do you, how do you create a system where everybody that has a voice or wants to have a voice can, can, you know, use it, but it isn't a burden or in the way of those that don't. And I think their kind of takeaway, I, I wish I could remember who it was, but it, it stuck with me. And the, the gist of it was like, the idea is not to create a scenario where everybody kind of has to vote on everything, but it's to create a system where there are just many, many, many opportunities to, to mm. vote. And so we're talking about, you know, kind of a, a shepherded process where we source input from the community. And Dilip was saying, we've got a ton of people in there already that are hyper engaged and, and adding content like this just because they want to. And then we've also got a lot of people in there that don't chat at all. And they're just kind of, you know, staying attached and seeing how things play out. And that doesn't mean that they don't have ideas and opinions. It just means that they haven't seen the right opportunity to kind of add those in yet. And so, you know, we'll probably do this kind of diverging and converging model of creation where we source a ton of ideas, the society and the jump cut team kind of sort through those and, you know, tweak the dials and find the best ones. And then, you know, maybe we present the best of those back to the, the holders and our, our incentivized creators to vote on and things like that. And that, you know, that some of the specifics of that may change, but that's generally kind of how we're thinking about that process. And I think the important thing to Dillip's earlier point is having the right people in place that know how to kind of pick up the ball and carry it, right? It's not that we're going to just wait until everyone's had a chance to weigh in. Like we've got to maintain momentum and, and get things done. And so, um, again, just kind of finding as many opportunities as possible to let people engage in, in varying levels is going to be the key to, to moving this forward, I think. Yeah, I think that process makes a ton of sense. And that shepherding aspect is absolutely going to be really key. But I also like your idea of, you know, not forcing it, let, letting folks jump in and contribute where they want. Uh, you know, maybe for our viewers and, and listeners here who may not be as familiar with the project, maybe we we back up for a minute. And Joe, if you want to just kind of take us through the Society of the Hourglass project, uh, we've got the web page pulled up here. Maybe tell us yeah. a little bit about it. And we alluded to a roadmap, but maybe talk about it a bit. Yeah. So the Society of the Hourglass, you can see here, we're, we're a collection of 8,888 characters. Um, and like you said, we're, we're building an uh, an entertainment brand, um, not an NFT project. Like the, the NFT project just happens to be kind of the genesis moment of this brand that we're building. And uh, we have a long-term vision that is both kind of web three and in real life and all these other things. Um, the story itself is a really fun one that I think creates just almost infinite storytelling possibilities. So the general idea is that the, the Society of the Hourglass is this omnipresent organization that's kind of always existed through time. Um, you have the stewards, which are members of the society. Um, and then you have the competitors, which are famous historical figures that are kind of competing and, and playing to try and join the society. And so they're, they're kind of going through time, completing missions, working together, maybe going head to head at different times. And at some point along the way, these portals in time get stuck open. And so you start to see people from kind of across the world and across timelines going through. And so that's how you end up with these like time swapped characters. We've got, you know, cyberpunk, um, you know, cowboys and things like that. 
Um, and so the competitors have to kind of pause the competition and figure out like what's going on and start working together to figure out how to close the portals. And um, that's kind of the very beginning of the, the foundation that we're laying. And, you know, we're, we're, we're holding some of that with an open palm because we want to give the community room to influence and shape some of that as we go. But, you know, as we, as we think about what this story looks like, you know, we're thinking through conflict and, and resolution and how you, you kind of move, not just the, the story, but also the project forward and thinking about how that ties into mechanics uh, with the NFTs themselves. Um, I mentioned in real life, um, execution. We've got a. We're going to be releasing a an illustrated seek and find book like Where's Waldo as one of the first items that we we drop post mint. And we're really really excited about that. Our lead artist Mike is just a phenomenally talented children's illustrator, and he's done a few few books like this in the past. And um, so he he's got experience in this realm and knows what it takes to get this done. Um, but that's going to be kind of the first opportunity for us to lean into this education idea as well, right? So if you think about these books, typically seek and find books and stuff like that, it's more um, task or activity based, not so much narrative, right? Like if you open Where's Waldo, you're not necessarily reading a deep, rich story about why Waldo is in this spread. Um, so we're thinking about how you introduce narrative to not only teach about the past and learn about these characters that you're looking for, but also looking ahead into the future and learning about Web3 and NFTs and kind of weaving all of this together. Um, outside of the first edition of these books, we're also going to do another run and donate a bunch of these to schools and other educational nonprofits. Uh, you know, one of the things, if you look at kind of the, the breadth of characters in our collection, we have a really rich, diverse set of of characters represented here. Um, it, we want this to be a brand where anybody can find characters and heroes to identify with and relate to. And um, that one of the fun things about this is that it creates a collection that though the majority of it is generative, like they all look like one of one custom illustrated characters. Like we have 12 different base body types with individual traits for each one. And so it creates the, the most complex and visually diverse collection I've seen yet. And I'm, I'm really, really excited about that. And in fact, that's one of the things that led us to feel like we need to create our own tools in the space uh, because we couldn't find anything that would handle the complexity of art assets that we're creating. And so it, it's, you know, we, we've bitten off a pretty big chunk here, but we're really excited about it. And I think it's creating just almost infinite opportunities for telling really interesting stories and directions we can go with it. Yeah. I mean, you've gotten me excited about it. So I want to play this back and see if I'm understanding it right yeah. and, and correct me where I'm wrong. So you've essentially, you've created these characters and this universe, right? And so you've built the foundation here. Um, so I, I want to understand where the community engagement comes into play. So like yeah. the, one of the first steps is the, the publishing of this first seek and find book. Um, so is that book already written? Is that where the first level of community engagement comes in or kind of how is that all going to? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so yes, is the short version that is, that is the first opportunity for community to contribute. So we have a channel in our discord that is just about contributing ideas for character interactions and these spreads. So when you think about the scope of you know, 12 different spreads that each probably have two to 300 characters, many of which are going to be actual characters minted during the generative collection drop. Um, there, there are all sorts of ways that these characters can be interacting, right? This isn't just paste the static NFT characters and arrange them. Like these are, this, these are each gonna be re-illustrated and redrawn interacting with each other. So we've got a ton of just really fun, goofy over the top ideas being dropped in the discord right now that we're really excited about. And it's, it's creating just kind of a, a, an inspiration board in a way for us as, as Mike and the art team transition post-launch into getting started on illustrating the book. Like we have this kind of repertoire of ideas and things that we can pull from. And then adjacent to that, um, the, and this is the conversation Dilip and I had the other day that I was alluding to, we're, we're talking about what the beginning process for um, 
contributing to the animated series looks like. And we're actually going to be um, releasing some information in our Discord today to the community. It's kind of a an overview of what that process looks like and, and scheduling a, a call with the, the Jump Cut team, and again, in our Discord next week so that we can answer questions and kind of help people get excited about and on board with that idea so that they start jumping in. I think long term, we want to incentivize holders and give them the, the kind of lion's share of the influence. And so we're thinking about what it looks like to transition from this kind of pre-drop scenario where we want everybody contributing. And we're thinking about things like, you know, engagement and that unlocking different levels of influence and into the creative process. And then eventually it's going to be the token holders that are driving the majority of the, the creative process with us. I definitely want to put a pin in that and come back to that because that's really intriguing. Um, but for, for Dillop, I guess I, I want to hear now, so where's Jump Cut Media coming into play here and what's the initial focus? So it, is Jump Cut playing in on, on the book or is it more just the animated series that's coming out mm -hmm. and kind of what's the, what are the early steps here for Jump Cut? Yeah, so we're coming in as a narrative partner. And a part of that is thinking about the animated series that we've been talking about. But part of that is also just helping build this lore out further and help like kind of steward the community along and, and fleshing out what that universe looks like. So um, like Joe mentioned, we're still, uh, you know, we're about to make a lot of announcements to the community about this today or tomorrow, but um, kind of the high level on it is that we both want to work with the community to create the the foundation for the universe beyond what Joe just told you in terms of like, what are the rules of the universe? How does it work? So there's a little bit of structure and that lets us work with the community to make the animated series. And it also lets anyone in the community um, also work on developing stories and fan fiction and other kinds of derivative media around their characters. Um, once that they have like a, like a general canon that their stories can all fit into and plug into. So that's the very first step for us. Like, let's create, work with the community, make this creative foundation upon which anyone can build, including us as we build the animated series. That's cool. And I guess, how would you, how would you rate right now? I'd say like the, the engagement from the community and the discord, you know, for those who are starting to contribute ideas, do you feel like it's been a reinforcing feedback loop to, to keep them more engaged or kind of what's been your, your early reaction to, to how that's, that's been yeah. going? Uh, at least from my end, again, like I think blown away by how creative and engaged this community is. Like, if, again, if you're thinking about it, like this we're very early people were pre-drop, people don't even have their characters yet. And they're already excited about contributing to this universe and writing really high quality stories and imagining cool scenes for the book. Um, so, I mean, given the stage of like, like still how early this project is, it's um, insane to see uh, this level of engagement. Uh, from a community and as Jump Cut, like we've worked with other digital communities, we've built shows around other projects and Facebook groups. So we've seen a lot of internet um, communities and especially to see this discord at this stage. Uh, so uh, invested in like high quality engagement has been really awesome. That's great to hear. I mean, shared ownership is incredibly powerful. And again, I think we're just scratching the surface of what it means for community building and engagement. And it certainly seems like it's going to be just increasingly powerful. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, th I think that's a huge part of like the success of the apes, right? Like they're, they've created this brand around being kind of a part of something bigger than yourself. And I, I think in ways that's, there's a lot of that that we're trying to do here. Um, you know, I, I, I want to show my kids that there are alternative paths that, you know, that aren't just go get a job. Like you can find new ways to kind of create, uh, you know, opportunities for yourself. You can influence things that maybe in the past felt super out of reach. And, and my kids are asking me all the time about the society, of the hourglass, which is still a little weird sometimes for them to be asking me about NFTs, but like they're super engaged. And so, thinking about the opportunity even to get like kids and, and people that aren't in this space that invested in something like this to me is huge. Like imagine when Coinbase finally flips the, the key on their marketplace and brings in, you know, 60 million people into the space that aren't here yet. Um, the opportunities for, for people like that to find projects like ours and others and, 
be a really, really influential part of helping shape that future is just super, super exciting. And, and how old are your kids, if you don't mind my asking? Yeah, no, so I, I've got a spread. My oldest just turned 13 back in yeah. June, which is weird. Um, and then my youngest just turned eight last month. So and my, my son's right smack in the middle at 11. I, I've got two toddlers, so I'm not quite there yet. Uh, <laughs> but something I'm trying to keep my, my finger on the pulse of, right, is what in the NFT Web3 sphere is starting to resonate. Yeah, with, you know, more of the teenagers, you know, folks who are going to be, you know, players in, you know, three to five short years. Totally. Um, and I think we're starting to see some trickle down already into that market. Like yeah, I think so. And, you know, like I, I've, I've set up wallets for all three of my kids and this is going to be their first NFT. And I'm really, really excited about being able to do that. You know, they're they're maybe not going to be as knowledgeable or interested in it from an investment standpoint but like my oldest daughter in particular like she's right at that age now where being able to contribute to the creative process because she owns one of these is going to be huge for her Um, you know she's she's big into harry potter right now and is going through that book series and so she's kind of right at that perfect age where she's discovering these big fantastical worlds that kind of, you know, you can, you escape from reality through. And I, I think the opportunity for the society, the hourglass is to be that kind of, of narrative universe for people. Like I always describe this as like, you know, Bill and Ted meets back to the future meets the magic school bus meets where's Waldo. And, um, I, I want people in, you know, 20, 30 years talking about how they remember reading and watching the Society of the Hourglass in school in, in the same way that like I do Schoolhouse Rock. Um, like, I think that's what we're, we're building here. And that's what the opportunity is. Absolutely. And in some ways, right, like the Web2 model, uh, with respect to books, it was, you know, choose your own adventure. From a reading perspective, now we we're in write your own adventure. Yeah, totally. Uh, which it, is it's so cool. Super cool paradigm yeah. shift. The earlier you mentioned some value to long term holders. I think this might be uh, in line with one of our other talking points that I wanted to touch on uh, was with this creator platform. So we, we yeah. see on the site uh, future tools plus an extended roadmap. Each token holder will receive pre sale access to future collections that meant through Hashku. Um, so I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about Hashku and what that is. Yeah, so we're we're super excited about Hashku. Um, so one one thing to to maybe understand about our team is that some of our team is running a startup studio called Cartwheel Studio, and it's, it's a funded, invested startup studio, and, and that's helping us build this platform. The idea is that we will make that platform available to other teams and creators. So right now we've been kind of hyper-focused on the minting process. We used it for our our Mint Pass collection, which we haven't talked about yet. I can share more about that here in a few minutes. Um, But, you know, we're trying to design a platform that helps account for things like bot attacks and gas wars, which gas wars are maybe a little bit less of an issue right now just with the state of Ethereum. But um, you know, we're, we're optimizing for the purchasers, the consumer experience. Um, on top of that, it's handling pre-sale registration. Behind the scenes, it's actually also handling the random gener- generation of our art assets. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier the, the complexity that we've got in this collection and the, the amount of layers we have for different clothing types and arms and hands and face traits and things like that is just beyond anything that, that we've been able to find. And so we're going to have this really, really capable, robust art generation tool as a part of that platform. Um, in fact, we've, we've onboarded another project into it already. Mystic Wizards, if you, if you mm. haven't checked them out, they're a really cool project. They're going to be using Hashku for their, their Mint. Um, long term, we want it to handle smart contract deployment and things like that. So the idea is that any individual even or, or team that maybe doesn't have experience in the space yet could use this platform to power a new collection and do it really, really well in a safe, secure um, you know, way with a, with a really great UX on the, on the consumer side. Um, and from a, from a value standpoint, you know, we're also thinking about like, what's the, what's the collector experience on that 
platform and you know what does it look like to register and be a, a holder of multiple items that minted through the platform and you know can it maybe be a repository for information because discord is like a terrible file management system and it's awful for trying to find information about the projects that you're in um, and then the way that we're we're monetizing it right now is just asking for a certain number of NFTs and pre-sale spots from projects that are using it. And we'll mm. feed that back into our token holders. So as the platform grows and more and more projects use it, we have this bigger and bigger pool of exclusive types of access and, and NFTs that we can then funnel back into there. And so you're constantly kind of being fed those types of rewards just for being a holder, um, even outside the context of our collection itself. Like if you don't want to participate and do anything in the creative process, you're getting value for out of, out of Hashku by just being a holder, which is really cool. That's so interesting. So a, a few questions, uh, a lot to unpack there. So yeah. in some ways, <laughs> Society that Hourglass is kind of like the Genesis token for Hashku and, and then potentially, you know, some passive income yield. Uh, yeah, yeah, in, in a way, like th there's probably a future here where the Society of the Hourglass and Hashku like diverge paths a little bit. Like we're so inexplicably intertwined right now because mm -hmm. it's the same team building all of it. Um, but they, they serve different purposes long term. And so we're thinking about what that looks like. But they, they'll always be coupled in a way that Hashku is kind of giving preferential access and incentives to the Society of the Hourglass. Got it. And I think the, the other part of my question, just the we certainly have been seeing uh, this new trend in creator platforms. And it's something that I've been watching very closely. You know, we've had Doodle Labs with their platform drop, kind of using the art blocks technology, mm -hmm. brain drops in the AI generated space, quantum art in the photography and FT space. Uh, you know, I think from an investor standpoint, it's the, the platform plays and the Genesis collections are always top of mind and seem yep. like really strong long-term plays. I guess of, of those, have you been, you know, have you been watching any successes or, you know, uh, you know, factors of, of any of those platforms that you know, you've been looking at specifically? Or, or yeah, I, I don't know if I have a strong opinion on any of them individually, maybe just more as a signal that like seeing more people and, and teams building in that space, I think is, is a really great thing. Um, no, no one project or, or platform can nor should be everything to everyone. Uh, like, you know, even for us, like we're solving some of our own problems with Hashku, but that doesn't mean we're solving every problem for everyone else out there. And so um, I, I think there's plenty of room in this space. And the more of those types of platforms we see being built by really capable, experienced teams that know how to build technology and build and deliver software that works really well, the better the space is going to be in general. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm excited and super bullish just on the trend of seeing more and more of these types of platforms being built, uh, even if I maybe don't have as much time or mental bandwidth right now to go deep on any individual one. I think probably the, the, the biggest hit I've taken in the space since moving into the creator side of things, I just don't have the time to be as active a collector as I would like to be. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to a point where we get to normalize that a little bit and get back into collecting and paying a little closer attention. But uh, right now it's just more about kind of paying attention to big signals and looking at what the market's doing um, and, and just, you know, trusting that my portfolio is going to be there waiting for me when I can get back to it. <laughs> I was going to say, well, you haven't missed much the last few months. It's been mostly yes. uh, red since August. Yeah, that well, and that's what's interesting, right? Like, I, I got into this space really heavily back in July, like right at the beginning of this the stupid run we had up through like August, September. And so, even just in those few months, seeing the complete like polar opposite sentiments in the market has been really, really fascinating. Absolutely, but we've seen, we're seeing a lot of bullish indicators, you know, yep. although blue chips are down overall, open sea platform volume is pretty good right now We're yeah and it's you know if, if you look at the kind of trend of like early adopters to mass ad adoption of a, of a thing and, and look at not even just nfts but web3 in general like we're still so far on the front end of that early adopter cycle 
like just it sounds cliche and almost like an empty platitude to say that like just being here this early is is like you're gonna make it but I really truly believe that it just takes grit and, and resilience and a willingness to kind of stay along for the roller coaster of the day to day because in the long term like we haven't even gotten started yet totally agree uh, well you know so what's what's immediately next what do our listeners need to know so you mentioned jump cuts going to be coming into the discord with an announcement some announcement today and then maybe a call next week so maybe recap some of the upcoming next steps for yeah, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so actually, just earlier this morning, we, we dropped a, an announcement about some a, a leveling system inside of our Discord. So we're starting to kind of plant the seeds of getting the community engaged to earn access to contribute to that creative process. Um, we're putting the finishing touches on a, a document that, that Dilip and the team have worked up that's kind of helping explain what the general timeline for this creative process looks like, as well as how we're going to engage as a community with the Society of the Hourglass team and with Jump Cut in that process. I mean, then we're also planning to announce our drop date later today in our Discord. So that'll be probably the, the biggest alpha drop in there later today. Um, so be, make sure you get in there and, and check that out, because I think we're going we're gonna to hit the ground running once we, once we get that out there. Highly anticipated for sure there. Um, Dillop, any, any closing thoughts from, from your end? Anything to share for listeners? Yeah, I think the one thing I'll say is, um, you know, there's a lot of Discord communities out there and I'm in a ton, but if you're looking specifically, if you're a creative person and you're kind of interested in storytelling or writing or art or any kind of kind of creative art, um, come through, like come hang out on the side of the Hourglass Discord. It's going to be one of the best places on the internet to be part of building this huge entertainment brand. Um, and we're gonna have a lot of ways for people to get involved, like like Joe said before, like kind of addressing the issue of people wanting to help out, but not having the energy or knowing how or the motivation. Like we're gonna have a lot of like a clear curriculum and a lot of ways people can actually come in, learn about how to contribute and make contributions in a way that really shape the future of this project. Uh, so yeah, just an open invite for all creative people to come hang out in the Discord. I love it. I'm in the discord. I'm certainly going to be playing a more active role, at least watching you guys have me excited. Joe, awesome. any, any closing thoughts from, from your end? Uh, maybe just to kind of reiterate what Dilip just said, like we're, we're having a ton of fun in there. Um, would love for anybody listening to come check us out. Uh, we're, we, we try to make ourselves super available as a team. Um, so, you know, jump in, ask questions. We we're happy to kind of help direct people and help them kind of get the, the lay of the land. Uh, and yeah, just keep an eye on, on discord and Twitter. And, uh, yeah, we're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing another call this afternoon. We, we have a weekly Friday calls. We call it alpha Fridays where we just hang out in discord and chat about anything and everything NFTs. So that's maybe another good opportunity to come in and hear a little bit more from the rest of the team and just kind of feel the vibe. Cause that's, that's what it's all about. Right. That's the community building. That's one right, one. man. Well, well, love it. Really appreciate your time. Uh, here today to our listeners go get in the society of the hourglass discord check out their twitter page in our show notes after the show we'll we'll post links to everything uh, for those who may not have it so so look for those to come here later this afternoon but joe and Delp is, is great to catch up and we'll have to check in here uh in a little while to see how things are going so absolutely wish you guys the thanks best so much for having us yeah thanks for having awesome. us cheers all right to our listeners that's our show for today Thank you again to, to Joe and Dillup from the Society of the Hour class and Jump Cut for joining us for the interview. To our listeners, thanks for tuning in. We will be back next week with our new date. We are going to be starting on Tuesdays at 11 instead of Mondays. So look for us now on Tuesdays to recap the weekend in the NFT space. I'll be joined by uh, Brett Ritchie back from his stay in Las Vegas. So happy to be welcoming him back. So make sure to tune in for that. Till then, stay safe in those NFT streets. Goodbye.